Okay, it is now my pleasure to invite to stage uh, a very dear friend of Nutanix, Mark Templeton, former CEO of Citrix. Mark, come on up. Well, good afternoon. Is everyone thinking about delight in the sense of something that has some fizz to it, some ice in it, or maybe even an umbrella in it? It's like, yeah, I think so. So first of all, it's really delightful to be here. And um, I'll tell you why I'm delighted. There are three sort of fundamental reasons. First, uh, being here with lots of friends and colleagues that have been part of my personal journey, either as customers, as uh, part of the Citrix team, or, or partners, it's, it's a joy. Um, the second reason is I always love opportunities to talk about the future. And the reason I like to talk about the future is I like to think about how companies, people, organizations, not only stay relevant, set themselves on a path to increasing relevance over time. And it's when you have a path of increasing relevance, uh, you can put a dent in the world, as the saying goes. So <clears throat> really uh, wonderful to be here. Third reason I'm delighted to be here is I just love a captive audience, OK? So we have locked the doors, OK? And uh, here we go. So you know. I got here yesterday and I thought, wow, this is my first time in the wild since I retired from Citrix. And I'm going to talk about some things that are going on and sort of define the future. And really, it's about continuing the journey that, that uh, I've been on personally uh, via Citrix, uh, but maybe with some new friends, new colleagues along the way. So, this defined the journey, and I think it continues to define the journey. And it's really defining a moment, an experience of delight that I think we've all experienced. A moment where you're on the trampoline and you're in this place of weightlessness. You're at the top of the jump. And you remember how that felt when you were a kid? It's like, wow, I can fly. I can do absolutely anything. That is delight. Delight, it's really hard to put words around it, but it's sort of you know it when you feel it, and you know it when you see it in others. And this journey at Citrix was really about delivering this kind of experience to leave the world better than the way we found it. And I love what uh, Keith said around humanization, all right? The humanization of the world in a way that I think we as an industry and as IT professionals can do through the power of software. And I think the timing of this is just beautiful, just beautiful for all of you who are here at Next, really thinking about where do I go next, not only with my organization, maybe the potential for my career. So first of all, I think leveraging the new abstractions that we're seeing around software defined everything. You know, every time you put an abstraction layer in, you're, the simplicity and the delight and the joy of using something increases exponentially. And the potential increases exponentially. The, secondly, we have, I think, for the first time since we've been talking about run, grow, to actually right shift IT from run to grow. And, you know, the talks this morning at the opening really sort of, I think, really uh, punctuated that in a way that says, hey, I'm going to spend my time up the stack where the value is, not down in the stack where maybe, you know, it appeals to you know, our propeller head inside, but it, the value is not there and it's, it's leaving that layer 
at a high rate of speed. Just talked about using human experiences for competitive advantage. You know, some years ago, I thought that that would be a differentiator, especially in enterprise computing. It's not. In fact, it's table stakes. And if you're not doing this in the industry, you're not going to be relevant. And I would argue that in IT, if you're not thinking about how your company and your organization competes for resources in the, in the company on the basis of driving experience, whether it's the experience of employees, of your business partners, or of your customers, I think you're going to fall irrelevant. And then career-wise, I mean, it's exciting because you can actually step forward and be a leader, thought leader and action leader around digital business transformation. So when I think about this phenomenon, uh, it, it, to me it looks sort of like this. If you step back and you look at the trend line here, all right, the levels of abstraction, all about building on and standing on the shoulders of others. How many of you uh, can write assembler code? Okay, a few hands. Uh, that's actually a lot for, the, for an audience, by the way. Now, let me ask you that. How many of you have written assembler code in the last year? Okay. One, two, three, all right. P.S. Anyone who's written any code is running, it, it, you are writing assembler code by proxy because the layers of abstraction above it are now so sophisticated, all right, uh, the machine takes care of all of that underneath. And so what's happening is the amount of machine effort is growing exponentially by putting in layers of abstraction and decreasing the amount of human effort it takes to accomplish something. Now, if you then look at what, like, what happens to us, well, the visibility of the technology is on a you know, curve. I mean, Nutanix talking about invisible infrastructure, I think is uh, spot on. But frankly, the invisibility of technology is inexorably proceeding forward. I mean, if you look at bots, all right, there's an experience, all right, an amazing experience. I love bots. Why? Well, it's really simple, very little human effort, and the machine really does an amazing amount of work, and it's all invisible. You know, how an iPhone works and all that good stuff, it's like, who cares, all right? the technology is invisible. So simplicity actually is an illusion, right? The experience of simplicity is there because the complexity is hidden through some illusionary techniques. If you want to actually understand the science of doing that, um, look at John Maida's work. I mean, he's forgotten more about creating simplicity than anyone ever knows, all right? Um, he's uh, actually, he, ran, he was the head of MIT's Media Lab. He ran, uh, he was the dean of the Rhode Island School of Design. He's now at Kleiner Perkins in charge of uh, human experience. So the question is, what are we going to do with all this great time we get back, you know, through the efforts of machine? Well, I think this is where we get to either uh, get some of our weekends back. I love that. Um, it's very in, in, uh, in concert with the generation, certainly X, Y, millennial generation. Um, but what we're going to do is focus on what I like to call digital delight. You know, using technologies to create delight at a whole new level. Now, let me give you a metaphor. Um, because delight, you know, how do you measure this? You know, and you know it when you see it, but how do you measure it? So I was thinking that really the organization that I think universally, maybe globally, has a delight measurement system is Michelin. Michelin restaurants, Michelin stars, right? 
that's a way to quantify delight. So, you know, they're, 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 you can get up to three stars, right? Up to three stars. So, first star, how do you get the first star? What do you think? I hear whispering here. Come on, shout it out. Yeah. Food, you know, great food, fantastic, you know, and it has to be creative, it has to be really unique, etc. cetera. Um, what's the next star for? Service. So great food, unique food, and really outstanding service gets you the second star. But then, hey, food, service, what's left? How do you get that third star? Innovation, Innovation I like that. There is, there's no right answer, this is just what I have on this slide, okay? I think the third star, you get the third star when the experience has so much empathy and anticipatory fundamentals in it to where when you, before you realize you need your wine glass filled or you need the next thing or the next thing or whatever it happens to be, all right? It's there, the anticipation. I call that third star, the way you get it is magic. That's where the magic comes in and that's the hardest part. That's the differentiator and you put those three things together and you get three Michelin stars. I think that's our goal. I think that's our collective goal to run IT organizations in a way that we are seen as a three-star organization. We're providing incredible food, apps, okay? Those apps have great, unique qualities. We're providing amazing service, always on, always available. Many of the things that Keith talked about. And then that last bit of magic that, you know, it's hard to actually describe what it is. So now, is this a trend or is it actually a fundamental shift? I would say actually it's not even an IT era, okay? I think what's happening is we're in the midst of defining a new age, a new age. So I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a product designer by training and uh, so graphics and art, et cetera, has been a big part of my life. And I've found always the technique of squinting at things to be really helpful to understanding patterns and trends. Now why squint? Well, when you squint, you don't, it blocks out noise. You, the information and data gets blocked and you see shapes, forms, colors, patterns. That's the that's the benefit of the technique. So if I start, if I squint and I sort of go back to the 1800s, we'd see an, an age, it's the industrial age. You know, it's, it's the age that really set the, you know, uh, today, <laughs> the modern era off through the invention of repeatable processes to automate and more efficiently manufacture, th manufacture things and ushered in by people who were focused on practical. So the word practical was sort of the defining word for this age. And the generations, I've made it up. I call them the practicals or the pioneers who actually uh, produced what Tom Brokaw calls the greatest generation. The greatest generation actually not only leveraged the industrial age, they brought the industrial age to a whole new level of capability uh, through, a, through the 1940s and ushered in the ne next age, which is the modern age. Modern age defined by the whole idea of being functional. So industrial, now let's point to functionality. And the modern age was defined by less is more, simpler is better, um, 
If you look at the Bauhaus movement and Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius, et cetera, very linear and the, the, the pursuit was perfection, perfectly functional. Um, that greatest generation produced the boomer generation, um, born at the end of the modern, uh, modern age and ushering in uh, a postmodern age, all right, that defined by the whole notion of radicalness. So a reaction to the modern age. So Pollock's work, and sort of like, actually the expression was not less is more, less is a bore. And define an age defined by a generation um, uh, of boomers and, and uh, producing the X and Y gen. I think now we're in the contemporary age, an age that's defined by digital, all things digital, digital transformation. And over our lifetimes, we've seen the movement of things born analog to those things born, di born digital. So for example, if you go back to 1980, most documents were born analog. They were on a typewriter or they were written down, et cetera. And through various mechanisms, we tried to convert them to digital through scanning, imaging, uh, through creating them, through word processors, et cetera. And, but still the exception. Today, all documents and data, like born digital, and we only go analog by exception. So this age, contemporary age, defined by digital and being leveraged by millennials who are ushering in actually the next age. Now the best thing about being able to label ages, et cetera, uh, is I'm so old, I'm not gonna be here to know whether I'm right or wrong, okay, and measured on it. But <clears throat> it's important to have an opinion and I think this next age is a post-contemporary age that's defined by the idea of contextual. Contextual. Everything contextual can actually be more valuable, be more uh, powerful, and I don't think there's an explosion of devices. I think it actually goes the other way because contextual systems in a contextual world can make decisions for you without you taking an action. And today, like my children are X and Y. And because of the career I've had, they were born digital. But actually, millennials were actually born digital. And millennials in today's workforce are creating what will define the next age, and that is contextuality. Um, you think about anything, predictive analytics, big data systems, all the things going on in IoT. I swore to myself I wasn't gonna mention, I'll be there, but I, there I did it, okay? Um, and uh, defining what I consider to be a post-contemporary era, and that generation, I think, we could call them contextuals. They'll be born contextual, all right? They won't appreciate you know, the next thing, the next device. What they'll appreciate is a world that is easier, simpler, more productive, et cetera, driven by contextuality. So if we zoom out uh, and look at sort of how this uh, trend works, and from my point of view is that you know, the postmodern era was really about analog. And the contemporary era defined by digital. And we see things being defined more and more and more digital. I actually think we're actually peaking out. Um, and we can't handle more digital. We're on digital overload, generally speaking, as IT professionals and the people we serve. And the only way to keep going forward is actually through, is to try to return more and more to analog experiences that are informed by visual, digital. And I think that's a post-contemporary era 
that replaces the whole digital experience with a contextual experience. So if I was gonna do this in a math sort of layout, I would say analog plus digital will equal contextual when it reaches that level of advancement. So to test this set of ideas, I actually thought, you know, how does this fit with the things that I'm interested in and working on? You know, philosophically, I've always encouraged people to, if you see a problem or you see an opportunity, the first thing I want you to do is get up from wherever you are and run to the bathroom. You know why? There's a mirror in there. And, it, and the first place you look for solutions to problems or the root cause of problems or the potential for opportunity is at yourself. That's why, all right? So, and by the way, if you decide you're not the problem, move on, that's fine. So, where I've been spending my time is in these areas, in the whole notion of uh, web psychographics. So you know what web analytics is? That's really measuring the demographic characteristics of people on the web. Um, how about measuring the psychographic, the behavioral, and what's going on in someone's mind? Secondly is responsive lighting, lighting that's beyond smart. It's responsive to lots of inputs, ambient light, presence, uh, other smart devices like nests or other devices like that. Third is autonomic security, security that actually defends itself before, uh, that defends your systems before uh, you can take an action, all right, and remediates them before you even know, and then tells you exactly why, how, what the evidence was, what actions were taken. Um, and uh, last big area is human location analytics. And this is an area that is really creating what I call the ultimate dimension of contextuality, and that is precisely, passively, and actively tracking human location of individuals, of groups, and making that information embeddable in many, many third-party systems so that instead of trying to figure out, trying to teach uh, a nest or a lighting system um, a lot of behaviors, now that they, they can respond to human location. So this is the level of contextuality, I think, that we, we get to, and these, these are the, the things that I've been working on, and I realize that they're all in this area of creating context. So let's go back to the stars. So um, here's actually what Michelin says these things mean. And uh, so let me translate for you. So first, <clears throat> you do get the first star for a very good restaurant in category. And that means good food relative to others in the category. Secondly, because it was Michelin and you know, obviously they were, it was a road guide, um, excellent cooking, worth a detour. And the third star, worth a special journey. Cuisine, all right? So I think this maps really well. Cuisine, a special journey, that's the kind of magic that we're trying to create for those who consume our systems. Now, <clears throat> I have one more thing. And... Uh, it's one more thing that I'm working on, and this is it, okay? So, to me, this is the essence of delight. And as I said earlier, you don't know what delight is, maybe in words, but you know it when you see it. And when you see it, all right, it's profound experience. And so, if this video plays, there you go. <laughs> so, go out put a smile on the world. Make that smile the smile of delight. That's the opportunity for us in our careers, and it's the opportunity for our businesses 
to stay, not only stay relevant, to actually be part of a better world. So with that, I thank you very much. It's a real joy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you.